Welcome back to Central Planetarians. My name is Eric Nielsen. I'm an assistant professor at New Mexico State University. And today I'll talk about uh, exoplanet demographics, uh, in particular, what, they, what the observations tell us about theory. So I always like to start these talks with a, uh, uh, this wonderful movie from Jason Wang and Christian Marwa showing about 10 years of data as the HR 799 planets uh, uh, orbit their young star. And since we're talking about young planets uh, uh, this week, uh, it's, you know, a lot of this talk is going to be focused on direct imaging. Uh, and so I just have to set the stage here with, uh, you know, the sort of powerful images that direct imaging can give us, uh, especially when they're strung together in a movie like this, uh, watching the planets go about their orbits over about 10 years, uh, obeying Kepler's laws. Uh, uh, and, you know, in particular, uh, shows the power of direct imaging that, you know, in addition to having an image of the planet, uh, we can also take spectra of these once the light from the planet is separated from light from the star. And, you know, just to uh, sort of set the stage here, uh, you know, there's this classic plot here of some major axis versus mass uh, for, uh, you know, all the known exoplanets as of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and you see uh, with these uh, symbols and colors going by the detection technique, uh, the different types of planets uh, uh, each technique finds. Uh, so, you know, microlensing, you know, very good at planets between about, you know, one and 10 AU. Um, uh, transit's very good at uh, finding planets, you know, within one AU. Uh, RV, you know, so you sort of see the uh, the edge of the RV sensitivity curve here, this diagonal line here for all these wonderful RV planets. Uh, and finally, direct imaging planets uh, in the blue here, uh, large planets at wide separations. And of course, one of the powers of direct imaging, as you probably heard throughout this week, uh, is that it's one of the few techniques that will allow us to take spectra of the actual planets. We can uh, do uh, deep dives of characterization on these individual planets. So we can do this with, for close-in planets with transit microscopy, or we can do it for wider planets with direct imaging. Okay, so exoplanet demographics, uh, what is it? Uh, I, I sort of answer this uh, with you know, two related questions. Uh, and you know, one of the things that exoplanet uh, demographics gets to is trying to figure out what is the occurrence rate of planets? How many planets do you have per star? And the related question is, how does that occurrence rate change with properties of the star and properties of the planet. Uh, so, you know, how, how do the occurrence rate uh, change as a function of planet mass, so planet center axis? Do you have more planets uh, that are small and close to the star or more planets that are large and far from the star? Uh, how does it change with stellar properties, like the mass of the star or the metallicity of the star? Um, you know, all of these are basically imprints of how planet formation worked. Uh, and so uh, a good uh, measure of exoplanet demographics Let's us directly test theories of both planet formation and evolution, things like migration over time. Because we actually see where the planets are now, that tells us something about you know, uh, how they formed, where they formed, where they moved over time. Uh, and so we can learn a lot about the planet formation process uh, by having very precise knowledge of exoplanet demographics, again, all across planet parameter space, all across some major axis, all across mass, uh, through all these additional dimensions as well. Uh, also, uh, you know, if, uh, if you're interested in you know, designing a future survey or if you're interested in building future instrumentation, uh, it's very useful to know a little bit about exoplanet demographics. You want to know where the planets are likely to be uh, before you design your surveys. Uh, so, uh, you know, in a hopefully not very hypothetical example, when NASA uh, tries to design uh, the instrumentation for a HabEx or a Louvoir, uh, they're going to think a, a lot of, uh, about uh, design trades. Uh, you know, is it more advantageous to prioritize inner working angle, more advantageous to prioritize going to fainter planets? Uh, the answers to those questions depend a lot on where we think the planets are around the nearby stars. And so a detailed knowledge of exoplanet demographics uh, helps uh, these future design decisions. Okay, so a few more uh, definition of terms here. Uh, there are these two somewhat related quantities, but they have uh, a subtle but important difference. And that is planet fraction versus planet occurrence. And you'll see uh, papers quote one or both, um, but it, it's important to know the difference between the two. Uh, planet fraction is just the fraction of stars with planets. So if half of all stars have a planet, then the planet fraction is one half. Uh, so planet fraction can run anywhere between 0% and 100%. Uh, either all the stars have a planet, none of the stars have a planet, or something in between. Uh, planet occurrence, on the other hand, is the number of planets per star. And this can go above 100%. If every single star has eight planets, the planet occurrence is 800%. Um, and so again, it's a slightly different idea depending on how many multi-planet systems you have out there. 
Um, and uh, again, you know, it, it's it's uh, rare to talk about this across all of parameter space. Normally, this is a zoom in on a, a particular bit of parameter space, usually corresponding to the survey that just did the work. Um, so, for example, for a transit survey, you'll see these results given uh, for you know relatively close in planets. For a direct imaging survey, you might see numbers like this: uh, the planet occurrence rate from one to thirteen Jupiter masses, ten to one hundred AU, one and a half to two and a half solar masses. Uh, so, so usually given where the survey that's uh, uh, you pulled the number from did its work. And where, uh, you know, how do you get these two numbers? Uh, well, you know, the, uh, the basic definition is relatively straightforward, that they're just fractions. Uh, so you just count up the number of stars with planets, divide that by the total number of stars, and that would be your planet fraction. Uh, so, you know, here you count up the number of stars, count up how many of those have planets, divide the two by each other, you get planet fraction. Uh, similarly, for planet occurrence, uh, you count up the total number of planets in this diagram, divide by the total number of stars in this diagram, uh, and you get the planet occurrence rate. Uh, so again, uh, the, the, the basic definition is relatively straightforward. What makes it more complicated is this idea of completeness, uh, that you know, not all planets are equally easy to detect. Some are easier to detect than others, and so you have to account for the fact that as you move across parameter space, as you think, consider different simulator axes, different masses, uh, you have different completeness, uh, completenesses to planets of different types. Uh, and this is important because it, it, no matter what technique you're using, there's going to be a, a, an intrinsic bias in what planets are easier to detect, which planets are harder to detect. Uh, and so you really want to make sure that you uh, uh, characterize the completeness of your survey uh, in order to you know, understand that completeness, in order to actually compute exoplanet demographics. And just a couple of examples here, uh, a direct imaging example here from the tongue plot, which we'll talk about uh, uh, later on. Uh, basically, the uh, completeness to planets as a function of some major axis and mass. So most complete to higher mass planets, uh, yet less complete as you move closer to the star, further from the star. But there's a sweet spot in the middle from about 10 to 100 AU, uh, where this uh, GPI survey was most sensitive uh, to giant planets and to ground dwarfs. A uh, similar result, a uh, similar uh, sort of plot from uh, the radio velocity side of things, a uh, recent paper by Lee Rosenthal, uh, looking using ejection recovery tests uh, to show uh, where the survey is complete to uh, uh, different types of planets. Again, more complete to higher mass planets, mass on the y axis, and major axis on the x axis, more complete to higher mass planets closer to the star, becoming less complete going into the red uh, as you go to lower masses and larger major axis. Okay. And before I go too far, I, I just want to do a quick advertisement here for uh, a couple of resources uh, you might find useful if you're uh, getting into exoplanet demographics. Uh, first of all, NASA SIG2, uh, SIG is a, a science interest group, uh, is basically concerned with the question of what, you know, what are our best measures for exoplanet demographics, what are our best practices, uh, what are good resources uh, for the community. So if you're doing exoplanet demographics, if you're thinking of starting up exoplanet demographics, uh, you know, we want you in SIG2. Uh, so, you know, just uh, uh, go ahead and contact us. Uh, SIG2 is run by Jesse Christensen and uh, uh, Michael Meyer. Um, but, you know, uh, just you know, uh, find us on the web, uh, contact any, any group member. We're happy to get you involved in our monthly telecons and discussions of uh, uh, exoplanet demographic uh, works. And also, there's a, a wonderful archive on the NASA Exoplanet Archive for past uh, exoplanet demographics papers. So, if you want a nice bibliography of the work that's been done, uh, with demographics, again, in, in uh, using a variety of techniques, microlensing, transits, radial velocity, direct imaging. Uh, this, is, you know, this is a great resource to uh, do a little background reading on the work that's been done so far. Okay, so I'm gonna give a very, very uh, 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 brief history of the beginning of exoplanet demographics and then jump forward to direct imaging. Uh, but you know, some of the uh, you know, early results uh, came from the radial velocity method, which at the time had uh, the, the vast majority of planets uh, uh, that, that, had been, uh, that had been found to date uh, were found using the radial velocity method. And so one of the very uh, earliest demographic results was the realization that there was a correlation between uh, the, plan uh, the planet fraction uh, and the metallicity of the host star. More metal-rich stars uh, ha uh, uh, had a larger likelihood of, of hosting planets than more metal-poor stars. Uh, a few years later came another result, uh, the correlation between stellar host mass uh, and again, planet fraction. Uh, so again, percentage of stars with planets, planet fraction on the y-axis, stellar mass here on the x-axis. And so as you turn up the mass of the star, 
uh, the star is more likely to harbor a giant planet, specifically a giant planet within a few year or more period, the kind that the velocity is most sensitive to. And uh, you know, the question is, okay, so we, we have now two early demographic adults, more planets around metal, poor, uh, metal rich stars, more planets around higher mass stars. What does that mean for planet formation? So specifically, giant planet formation. Because remember, we, we never talk about planets across all of parameter space. We usually talk about planets from specific uh, observing techniques that have their own sensitivities. So uh, what are the different models of giant planet formation? And there's essentially you know, uh, two uh, main paradigms that we think of. One is the core accretion process, which is a bottom-up process. Uh, basically happens in two steps, where first you form the core of your giant planet out of solids uh, uh, in the disk. Uh, ices and, and rocks and metals in the disk. And once your core gets to about uh, to be about 10 Earth masses in size, the gravity is strong enough that it can start pulling down significant amounts of gas from the disk and grow to you know, very large uh, uh, masses uh, you know, uh, before the gas in the disk goes away. Uh, alternatively, uh, there's the top-down process of gravitational instability. Uh, this is where the, uh, uh, the uh, parts of the disk become unstable, uh, start to collapse gravitationally, and very, very quickly, uh, in a relative sense, uh, you start getting uh, giant planet mass uh, 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 pieces of the disk uh, start to appear and, and later become uh, planets. And this is, you know, while core accretion is, we're talking about you know, millions of years uh, to take place, gravitational instability uh, is much, much faster. The, the time, uh, time stamp on the simulation here runs from 100 to 400 years. So a much faster, much more efficient way of making these giant planets. And, uh, where do these you know, initial results uh, uh, come down? And I'm just gonna you know, give you the answers that the original authors uh, put forward. And they, they both uh, uh, saw this as favoring the core accretion scenario over the gravitational instability one. Uh, in particular, um, you know, if, if uh, you turn up the metallicity of the star, you probably turn up the metallicity of the disk. There's more solid material in the disk, and it makes sense that you can form your cores faster, more efficiently around a metal rich star than you can around a metal poor star. Uh, similarly, uh, the larger stars, more massive stars should have larger disks, and so it would make sense that uh, there's therefore more solids in the disk, you can again form those cores uh, more quickly. Uh, so again, early demographics results uh, pointed to uh, core accretion as the primary uh, way that these uh, planets that were seen uh, were formed compared to gravitational instability. So by counting the number of planets, by seeing how those vary with uh, parameters, in this case the stellar parameters uh, of metallicity and uh, host star mass, uh, you're able to start to place constraints on uh, 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 possible formation mechanisms of these planets. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk a lot about direct imaging in this talk, uh, largely because we're here to talk about young planets and most of uh, our knowledge of young planets comes from direct imaging. Uh, but again, you know, a, a lot of these uh, basic ideas are applicable to other methods as well. So when I talk about direct imaging, I'm legally required to do this analogy that direct imaging is like staring directly into the beam of a lighthouse and trying to spot a firefly sitting at the edge of the lighthouse. Um, the numbers actually about work out for, for what we can currently do with direct imaging on the ground. So uh, if you want to do reflected light, that's very, very hard, and we can't do it from the ground where, where, uh, where we are now. So most reflected light planets are going to be about a factor of a billion or 10 billion times fainter than their star. Uh, which uh, you know, will require you know, uh, uh, large spacecraft uh, to, to actually reach those contrasts. Uh, what we can do from the ground is a somewhat easier process of looking for young planets. Uh, young planets uh, in particular, not in reflected light, but in thermal emission. Because when a, when a planet forms, it's very hot. Uh, all the gravitational potential energy of the material that made the planet uh, has to go somewhere. It goes into making the planet very hot. Uh, and so the planet starts out hot and luminous and bright and then it cools down over time. And in particular, if you look in the infrared, uh, uh, the contrast ratios are a lot more uh, favorable than trying to look for these exact same planets through uh, reflected light. Okay, so a very young planet uh, uh, will actually, uh, the, the very youngest planets will have an M spectral type. Uh, they'll cool uh, 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 you know, from thousands of degrees to hundreds of degrees uh, and, and until finally you know, reaching a state like Jupiter, uh, which is very, very cold where the uh, amount of reflected light, the amount of uh, thermally emitted light is about equal for Jupiter. But if you go to younger systems, and we're young here is about say a few hundred million years or younger, uh, the amount of thermal emission is very significant uh, and uh, actually makes it feasible to detect these planets in the glare of the star. 
All right. Uh, just putting some numbers behind this, this is a, a great plot from uh, Adam Burroughs uh, showing uh, stars in blue, brown dwarfs in green, uh, and planets in red, uh, giant planets in red, uh, as they evolve over time. And so luminosity on the y-axis, time on, on the x-axis. Um, as stars form, uh, they, they start to con they, they contract, uh, they become less luminous, until eventually the uh, core gets hot enough for hydrogen fusion, at which point uh, they, they no longer uh, move down this diagram and they, and they become stable. They hit the main sequence uh, and the luminosity does not change, uh, at least for billions and billions of years. Brown dwarfs, they have, uh, uh, they, they'll never get the core hot enough to, uh, for hydrogen fusion to happen. Uh, there's a couple of blips here along the way where deuterium fusion happens for the highest mass stars. Lithium fusion will happen. Uh, but for the most part, they're just cooling and cooling over time uh, with nothing to stop that cooling uh, as they just get fainter and fainter. Uh, planets don't, are, never even get uh, hot enough in the core for deuterium fusion, and they just, just keep cooling over, over their entire lifetime. So what does that mean for direct imaging? Well, it means that if you find a planet, uh, you're not going to measure mass directly. Uh, other techniques will measure mass directly, like radio velocity or astrometry or microlensing, uh, but direct imaging uh, we're going to instead measure the luminosity of the planet and the temperature of the planet because we have light from the planet, but we don't have a direct measurement of the mass. So where do we get mass from? Well, we get it from models like this one. Uh, we turn the luminosity we measure and the age of the system into a mass of the planet, which means the mass we derive is very, very sensitive to the age of the system. So just as an example, suppose we find a planet a uh, few times in the minus five uh, solar luminosity. Uh, what is the mass of this planet? Well, if it's a million, uh, if so, uh, it's only a million years old, uh, that's a one Jupiter mass planet. Uh, if you turn up the age of, uh, of this object, though, uh, it goes up to 13 Jupiter masses at about 200 million years. And if this object is, is not, you know, one million years old or even 200 million years old, but close to 10 billion years old, it's not a planet at all. We've been looking at a 73 Jupiter mass brown dwarf, uh, and so. You know, these are all objects with pretty much the exact same luminosity, uh, very similar temperatures, uh, but the mass of the object depends very precisely on the age of, of the system. Uh, in particular, the age of the companion, uh, which you usually get from the age of the host star. So where do we get the age of the host stars? This is a little bit of a rogues gallery of some of the directly imaged planets we know about to date. And many of them come from moving groups, which uh, you've heard about in other talks uh, 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 during this week. Um, so, you know, the, uh, many of the you know, most well-known uh, uh, direct imaged planets are in moving groups and associations, and a handful are, are in field stars, just, just stars that are uh, nearby to the sun, but not part of any larger uh, solar association. And, um, you, you know, you've heard about how you get ages for moving groups. Um, uh, when you have a field star, it's a little bit more tricky. You have to get the age for that star by itself, but it's still possible. And I just want to point out to a few references here if you're, you know, uh, find yourself uh, wondering how to get the age for a given star. Uh, for moving group stars, there are a couple of resources out there. Um, a wonderful uh, web resource of Banyan uh, is out there. Uh, Lacewing is available as a, as a separate code uh, to basically compare the kinematics of your star to known moving groups. Uh, if you're looking for the age of a field star, get a couple of uh, uh, um, uh, techniques you can use. Uh, rotation and isochrone, uh, if you know the rotation rate of your star and, and you want to use isochrones and the rotation rate to get the age, uh, I recommend the Stardate package. Uh, if you have lithium or calcium measurements from the spectrum of your star, uh, Baffles is a, is a nice uh, uh, open source package uh, to get uh, age posterior based on that. So again, you probably want ages if you want to do anything in direct imaging. And uh, uh, here is sort of a, a nice uh, you know, partial set of references to, uh, to get it there. Okay. So you have an age for your star now. Uh, um, now we want to start thinking about how do we, uh, uh, now that we've taken our observation, uh, what is the completeness to planets that we have? And for direct imaging, the most important uh, uh, characterization of, of an observation is a thing that we call the contrast curve. Uh, this is the limiting flux ratio or magnitude difference where we can detect a planet uh, or, or a companion of any kind. Um, and so, you know, most of the contrast curves have this sort of, you know, general shape here, uh, sort of flat in the outer parts and then rising up the uh, um, inner parts. And what's plotted here is separation or acceptance, so separation on the sky, uh, with contrast or, or delta magnitude on the y-axis. Uh, and, and again, modern direct imaging uh, systems 
uh, can hit contrasts of you know somewhere around 10 to, 10 to the minus six, one part in a million, 15 magnitude of contrast, somewhere within uh, a one arc second. Um, so there's a lot of work has been done to get the contrast curve to that point, uh, both on the instrumentation side, the, um, as well as the data, uh, data reduction side and the observational strategy side. Uh, but you know, uh, modern direct imaging uh, surveys can reach these sort of million to one contrasts, usually uh, well within one arc second. Okay, um, and let me point out that you know a, a contrast curve depends on your instrument. It depends on the data reduction uh, process you use. It also depends on things like the brightness of the star. Your AO system will usually work better if you have more counts compared to fewer counts. Uh, it'll depend on the air mass, how much air you're looking through. Uh, that will that'll affect how well the AO system performs. Uh, the amount of rotation if you're doing ADI depends on the weather. So it's not really the case that you know if you look at 100 stars with the exact same instrument using the exact same data reduction, that you'll have 100 identical contrast curves. You probably won't. You'll probably have a range depending on what the weather was, uh, what the observational conditions were, uh, how the data were taken. So again, over the course of a survey, you'll probably have a very uh, heterogeneous set of contrast curves. Um, and how those contrast curves uh, uh, translate to physical units depends on the star that you're observing as well. Uh, so again, these are the you know, typical units you see a contrast curve unit in. So separation on the x-axis, uh, usually in arc seconds, and uh, delta H magnitude or contrast ratio on the, on the y-axis. So 15 magnitudes of contrast is about a factor of a million to one in brightness between the star and the planet. And again, sort of you know, uh, a factor of a million to one and about half an arc second is, is current to the signal of the arcs. Uh, this is a GPI contrast curve, by the way, just to uh, sh uh, show my biases up front. Okay, so we want to uh, change these you know, observational units, uh, delta H and separation, into physical units to actually understand the planets that are orbiting the stars. Uh, so in order to get from uh, the y-axis, we want to go from delta H to planet mass. Uh, we need a few things. We need the absolute magnitude of the star. That's not so hard. Uh, we need the star's age. That can be a little bit tricky. Uh, and we need uh, to rely on evolutionary models. Uh, and, and there are a lot to choose from. There, there are the Kahn models, the set models, the Snore models, a lot of models out there. Uh, but you know, uh, choose your favorites. Uh, and it will allow you to use the age of the star, the star's absolute magnitude, the contrast curve uh, to convert this into planet mass. Okay, so that lets us get the y-axis from delta H into mass and Jupiter masses. And then the, the x-axis is a little bit more straightforward. We just need the star's distance uh, to convert separation in arc seconds to separation in AU. And so uh, for this contrast curve here, uh, this is what it would look like for a uh, 20 parsec star that's a G0 spectral type that's 100 million years old. Uh, so again, at about 10, uh, 10 AU, uh, reaching uh, a contrast suitable to see four Jupiter mass planets and above. So anything above the contrast curve can be detected. Anything that's below or too close in or too far away can't be seen with this observation. All right, so just uh, uh, take this little toy model here. Uh, what happens if you change the parameter of the star? So again, this is for a G0 at 20 parsecs at 100 million years. If we change the distance, the main thing that happens is that we move the contrast curve uh, closer or further away. And so for a five parsec star, uh, that contrast means we're getting into you know, very close to you know, one AU uh, giant planets. Uh, if we're looking at a star that's 150 parsecs away with that exact same contrast curve, uh, you know, uh, then we're, you know, we're not getting to one AU, we're not getting to 10 AU, maybe sort of like 30, 40 AU is, is where we're going. Uh, so, uh, how close into the star depends on how far away the star is from the Earth. And I'm, I'm skipping over a couple other effects here. Uh, uh, the, the performance of the AO system probably depends on how bright the star is, is, which in turn depends on how far away it is from the Earth. Uh, and also the brightness of the star affects uh, how quickly you hit the read noise floor of your contrast curve. Uh, but you know, the, just the, the main uh, uh, difference though between stars of different distance is moving the contrast curve inward and outward. Okay. What if we change the spectral type of the star? So we leave all these stars at 20 parsecs, we make them all 100 million years old, we just change the spectral type, go from early uh, spectral types of A to late spectral types of M3. Um, and the main thing that we're changing here is the absolute magnitude of the star. Uh, the, as the star becomes uh, uh, brighter, uh, the contrast curve uh, uh, is less able to detect lower mass objects. So again, think about this, your, your contrast curve says you can see planets that are a million times bigger than the star. But if you turn the star's brightness up, 
it means you can't see planets uh, that are quite as faint, quite as low mass around that very bright star than you could around a much fainter target star. So this is what that contrast means for a, a zero star, uh, sort of, you know, sort of a 10, uh, 10 AU getting to maybe seven, eight Jupiter masses. But if uh, uh, you have that exact same contrast curve around the M3, uh, we're getting down to, you know, below two Jupiter masses, you know, much lower uh, mass planets that you can see around these lower mass and therefore fainter stars. Okay, and finally, age. A age is very important here. Uh, I, I've changed the y-axis now to a log scale, going from 1 to 13 Jupiter masses for planets, 13 to 80 Jupiter masses for brown dwarfs. Uh, and changing the age of the star uh, means these planets get fainter as you make them older. And so for a very young target star, a 10 million year old target star, uh, you know, you're, I'm basically hitting the bottom of, of my model grid here, uh, where I, you know, I, I see that we're sensitive to planets you know, uh, at one Jupiter mass, probably below as well, um, you know, very close to the star. But as I make the star older and older, 30 million years, uh, 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 100 million years, uh, I become less sensitive to planets of lower masses. And I guess to the point where if a star is a billion years old, uh, with, this, with this contrast curve, I can just bear, I'm barely sensitive to planets. You know, I, I barely hit uh, 10 Jupiter masses. Uh, so you know, planets between 10 and 13 Jupiter masses I can see with this observation, uh, not, not much else. Uh, and at 3 billion years, uh, I'm sensitive to brown dwarfs, but not planets at all. So again, uh, you want the youngest stars if you want your contrast curve to actually reach planetary masses. Um, and one more point on completeness here uh, is that uh, orbital parameters are very important. And in particular, converting between uh, separations, specifically projected separation on the sky uh, and some major axis uh, requires a bit of thought about how orbital parameters affect all this. And the, the, the best example I have of this is Beta Pictoris B. Uh, this is a, a data, this is a movie of Beta Pictoris B uh, using a data from GPIs. Uh, and you see, you know, the planet has a very, almost uh, a very, very edge on it. Not quite 90 degree inclination, but very, very close. Uh, and so depending on when we observe the star, uh, you know, the, the planet could be 0.4 arc seconds away, or it could be, you know, almost exactly on top of the star. It doesn't quite translate like this very close. Uh, and so the separation, the projected separation on the sky, uh, changes over time and depends on the orbital parameters. Uh, it, it'll uh, you know, get very, very small for very inclined orbits, uh, but you know, the, the separation will uh, stay relatively larger for more face-on orbits. Uh, another example of this is 51 Eridani B. Uh, 51 Eridani B is a planet that was discovered with GPIs in 20, uh, with an observation in 2014. Uh, we then followed it up uh, uh, through you know, a few years later uh, and you know, these are orbit fits from uh, uh, DeRose et al. 2019, uh, a couple of families of orbits that you see here. Uh, and you know, the, uh, uh, you know, we saw that you know, relatively close to maximum elongation for a lot of these orbits, uh, you know, depending on which orbital family you believe, uh, but you know, uh, it was relatively far from the star when we found it. Um, but you know, this was not the first time uh, that direct imaging surveys have looked for planets around for Tuan Eridani. Uh, in 2011, it was not detected with IDPS when it was probably somewhere here in its orbit. It was not detected with NICI, the near infrared chronographic imager, in 2008 uh, when it was observed probably somewhere around here. And 2006, not detected with the MMT um, uh, um, as, as part of a, a survey uh, then. Uh, and, and again, you know, there's a little bit of generosity here. Uh, these, uh, as you move down this list, the planet is probably getting further away from the star, then depends on which of these orbits you believe, uh, but also the instrumentation is improving. Uh, instrumentation gets more sensitive as you move further down the list. So some combination of you know, unfortunate uh, uh, location in the orbital phase space, some combination of better instrumentation, uh, you know, both going to why the planet was detected in 2014 and not detected in any of these previous attempts. Okay. So again, to just say that again, uh, you know, uh, there are planets that are probably at some unfortunate orbital phase that if we do our survey tonight, we'll, we'll miss. Had we done our survey five years ago or 10 years ago, we would have seen the planet, but we, we'll miss them tonight just because the planet is at a, at a part of its orbit uh, where it just gets a little bit too close to the star. So how do you account for this uh, observational incompleteness? Um, there are a couple of different ways, some analytical techniques. <clears throat> I personally use Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, there, there's a nice open source package called Ness uh, that, that you can download to uh, uh, um, 
uh, to, to actually you know, uh, do this analysis with your own data. But essentially, it's a way of marginalizing over Orville El Elmondson phase when you compute your completeness. And so, uh, in this particular Monte Carlo simulation, uh, planets are all put in with uh, all with a single value of mass, all with a single value of semi-major axis. And so, single value of mass, so they're all in the you know, this, this uh, uh, horizontal line here. But because they have the same value of semi-major axis, but different values of the other orbital parameters, uh, they spread out in separation. There are different orbital phases. We see them at slightly different parts of their orbits. And so the ones that are above the contrast curve can be detected. The ones that are below would not be detected. And so completeness is just the fraction of those injected planets that lie above the contrast curve. And when you repeat that over an entire grid of mass and some major axis, you can build a completeness map, uh, a plot of you know, what combinations of mass and some major axis you are uh, mo more complete to, what combinations you're less complete to. Uh, so, so in this example here, this is uh, of uh, GPI data of 51 Eridani. Uh, we're most complete to this you know, uh, inner part of the plot, and then we become less complete as you move further away from the star, as you move closer to the star, or as you move down in planet mass. Uh, there, uh, there are some combinations of orbital elements uh, for you know, a, a, some major axis of five, uh, where uh, the planet would be just above the contrast curve. Uh, there are some combinations of orbital elements uh, where the some major axis is 100, where the planet is close enough to the star to, uh, to, be, to uh, be detectable, but some combinations where it's too far away. And so, for example, this, you know, this is 51 Eridani itself, uh, the planet, uh, and it was pick, uh, picked up in the region of maybe 60% completeness. And so, you know, we had to be a little bit lucky in order to see the planet when we did. Uh, also, this can be generated over, you know, multiple epochs. If you've observed the star multiple times, maybe with, even with multiple different uh, instruments and different observing bands, uh, you can put these together with Monte Carlo simulations to get the total completeness to planets. So, you know, you can actually increase your completeness by waiting a few years and repeating the observation because the planets will have moved and you increase your chance of seeing different planets. Right. If you take these individual completeness maps, so this is again for a single star, if you make this for every single one of your stars and they'll, they're gonna differ from star to star, the, the contrast curve will be different, uh, but the stellar properties, the age, the distance, the spectral type will be different as well. Uh, if you make uh, uh, a completeness map for every single star in the survey and then add them all together, you get what's uh, uh, traditionally called a, a, a depth of search plot. I prefer to call it the tongue plot, uh, which is the sensitivity to planets as a function of mass and some major axis uh, from your entire survey. Uh, and in particular, I, I like to give it by the number of stars uh, to which uh, 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 the survey was more sensitive uh, to uh, objects of different parameters. And some level, you can just read a current rate directly off this plot. Uh, so if you look at this inner contour here, 160 stars, uh, it sort of covers brown dwarf masses from about 10 to 70 AU. So you can say that for brown dwarfs between 10 and 70 AU, uh, there are 160 stars that the survey could have seen brown dwarfs. There are three brown dwarfs in that region that the survey saw. Therefore, the occurrence rate is about three out of 160. Um, and so it's a way of just you know, reading occurrence rate directly off the plot. It gets more difficult though, as you get to the edges of the tongue, tip of the tongue, so to speak, um, that uh, you know, as the occurrence rate changes, it's, it gets a little bit trickier to uh, you know, uh, solve for it directly and you need a somewhat more complicated method. And so th there are several ways of doing this. Uh, I'm gonna give you the, the method that I like to use, uh, but you know, look in the literature, look at other uh, demographics papers. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, you know, slightly different techniques, uh, but they all sort of come to use you know, roughly the same calculations and come to roughly the same answer. But here, here's the way I would do this. So first you need some sort of model of planet occurrence. Uh, you, you basically uh, want to fit a model, uh, uh, or in this case, a parameterized model, uh, find what those parameters are that bet, best fit the data. And so I always like power laws. And so uh, the number of planets per a bin in uh, uh, planet mass and some major axis is going to be uh, proportional to uh, planet occurrence rate times uh, mass to some power law times some major axis to some power law. Uh, so, that, so that's our you know, input parameterized model, and we want to constrain these parameters, uh, the occurrence rate, uh, the mass power law, the some major axis power law. And I like to use the Poisson likelihood, uh, uh, Poisson distribution uh, based on you know, basically two parameters, your expected number of objects per bin and your measured number of objects per bin. Uh, so expected to be measured, even the minus expected over measured factorial, uh, will give you your likelihood, at, again, as a function of uh, parameters in your model, F, alpha, and beta. 
Uh, so M, number of planets uh, that you actually measure in the bin, in this case here, that's two, one, two. Uh, and then E, the expected number of planets in that bin, which is uh, a little bit trickier to calculate, but uh, usually not so bad. Um, so again, you know, we're, we're, we have this likelihood, we're trying to find the value for E of uh, our expected. And so the expected uh, value of number of planets in this bin, uh, we need to do a little bit of, of uh, calculus here to integrate over changing completeness and changing occurrence rates. So again, uh, our model changes over, over this bin. Uh, it, it's a uh, you know, number of planets uh, as a function of mass at some major axis. So you want to integrate over the changes in that bin. Similarly, the fractional completeness changes over that bin. It's, it's more, we're more complete to objects here and less complete to objects down here. But if you integrate over, uh, over the size of the bin, um, that will give you the uh, occurrence rate of planets, number of planets per star, and then multi uh, number of planets per star that you detect, and then multiplying by the number of stars in the survey uh, will then tell you how many uh, objects you'd actually expect from your, from your survey uh, inside of that bin. Okay, so uh, let, me give, uh, let me take the last part of this talk now uh, to give some of the more recent results from exoplanet demographics. I'm going to take the speaker's privilege here of uh, starting with, with uh, results from the survey that I, I've been part of uh, the last few years, the Gemini Planet Major Exoplanet Survey, or GPIs, uh, but also talk about some results from uh, other groups as well. Uh, and just a reminder, you know, uh, uh, check the uh, uh, NASA Exoplanet Archive page on, uh, uh, on uh, papers about uh, exoplanet demographics from direct imaging as well as other techniques. Uh, there's a you know, very uh, rich uh, uh, literature here of uh, different groups uh, looking at uh, plants in different parameter space using different techniques. Okay, so GPI, the Gemini Planet Imager Exoplanet Survey. Um, I, I wanna make sure that I acknowledge, you know, over a hundred scientists and engineers are responsible for designing and building uh, and installing the instrument, uh, designing the survey, taking the data, reducing the data, analyzing the data. Uh, a lot of work uh, went into this, uh, which is true for a lot of, you know, modern direct imaging surveys. Um, but I'll just sort of you know, give you the demographics uh, uh, results of all of the work that we're this. Right, so uh, first things first, uh, um, planets versus stellar mass. So if we take the, the, the tongue plot, and the tongue plot I was showing before uh, was for the first 300 stars uh, observed by GPIs. And if we just break that, that tongue plot up by mass of the host stars. So we put all the low mass stars, stars that are about one and a half solar masses and less on the left, all the high mass stars, one and a half solar masses and above on the right. And then we zoom in on the region of wide separation giant planets. So two to 13 Jupiter masses, uh, uh, three to 100 AU. What, uh, you immediately see something you know, pretty remarkable here, which is even though there are fewer high mass stars in the survey, all of the planet detections are around the high mass stars. Um, so that's you know, six separate planets orbiting four distinct target stars uh, so, you know, both in terms of planet occurrence and planet fraction, uh, you know, there's, there just seems to be higher rates of um, wide separation giant planets uh, around these higher mass stars. And actually, we'll talk to be about a three sigma result in planet fraction, uh, that uh, it, it's, uh, you know, wide separation giant planets are just intrinsically more common around higher mass stars than lower mass ones. Okay, so that's, that's the first conclusion from uh, the GPI results. Uh, number two, if we look at planets versus brown dwarfs, uh, again, divide up the tongue plot by uh, at this time mass of the companion, uh, brown dwarfs from about 13 to 80 Jupiter masses, planets from about uh, uh, 1 to 13 Jupiter masses, uh, and you know do this parameterized uh, demographics analysis, uh, figure out what uh, power law indices best fit the distribution of brown dwarfs versus planets, uh, given the the sensitivity of the tongue plot, given the uh, where we detect objects. Uh, you know, uh, what are the, what parameters best fit the data? And this is what, uh, this is what these posteriors end up looking like. So these are uh, power laws in mass of the companion, uh, some major axis of the orbit, mass of the host star, and finally an overall occurrence rate. And the, the results are, you know, not quite as clear cut as these uh, solar mass uh, planet fraction correlation, but at about the one to two sigma level, it looks like these are not drawn from the same distribution. Um, so, you know, uh, more data would be very helpful to uh, say this a little bit more definitively, but, you know, we're seeing an indication that there's uh, two separate populations here. There's the uh, giant planet population and the brown dwarf population, and it's not the same population. Okay, 
Uh, so uh, third point then is about occurrence rate as a function of centimeter axis. Uh, so as you move a planet further away from the star, uh, and you know one of, one of the you know, great early uh, occurrence rate papers from uh, the radio velocity uh, community uh, was a paper by Andrew Cumming in uh, 2008. Uh, looking at data from uh, uh, Keck data of uh, radio velocity detection of, of giant planets, uh, seeing that the giant planet occurrence rate increases as you move further away from the star. So it's relatively small, close to the star, and then gets larger and larger the further away you move. And there is a lot of you know questions uh, in the literature after this about you know what is what does this occurrence rate do further away from the star? The 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 paper is very clear that it's, it applies to uh, um, uh, planets within about a you know four year orbital period. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of interest in what happens further out. And with GPIs, we have part of the answer now. Uh, we know that the planet occurrence rate declines as you move further away from the star from 10 to 100 AU. And so you have this rising power law and then a declining power law, and somewhere in the middle, a peak and a turnover, somewhere around the snow line and around a few AU. Uh, this nicely echoes uh, a work from about a year earlier from Rachel Fernandez uh, looking at uh, uh, radio, uh, other radio velocity observations. Uh, again, seeing this, this peak in the occurrence rate, rising power law, a peak, and then falling off. And this, uh, uh, this, this nicely matches uh, our results from you know, just about a month ago here uh, from the California Legacy Survey, uh, a paper led by B.J. Fulton, again, showing the occurrence rate as a function of semi axis, rising, hitting a peak, and then uh, declining. And very comfortably, we had very similar uh, measurements of the occurrence rate of giant planets at these very wide separations. Okay. So putting that all together, uh, again, a peak in the occurrence rate and then declining occurrence rate as you move closer to the star or further away. Uh, for high mass stars, it gets a little bit trickier. There, there's no, there, there are very nice measurements of the occurrence rate of giant planets around high mass stars for close-in planets, uh, but no measurement of the uh, uh, semi axis distribution. So, so I've drawn some plausible semi axis distributions here. And then the results from GPIs are this declining power law from 10 to 180. And so it, it, we could be seeing the same picture around higher mass stars uh, of a you know, rising power law and then a peak and then a declining power law, just given the occurrence rate uh, close in and the GPI's occurrence rate and distribution further out. Okay, so again, not, uh, whether you're looking at high mass stars or low mass stars, again, this is the same basic idea that you're not seeing the same uh, population, you're not seeing the same power law close in and further out. There's consistent with the peak uh, uh, at the occurrence rate somewhere around the snow line. Okay, what does that mean for uh, uh, theories of planet formation? So again, uh, these two big paradigms, poor accretion versus gravitational instability, ask the question, what do each of these uh, uh, two detection, uh, what, what do each of these two uh, uh, theoretical predictions predict uh, for what uh, we should have seen for wide separation giant planets? Uh, for poor accretion, you expect more planet, more companions around higher mass stars, uh, larger stars, larger disks, uh, more solids in the disk, a much weaker dependence on, on, on the mass of the host star with gravitational instability. Um, for the mass of the companion, uh, core accretion would say that there should be more low mass companions than high mass uh, companions. Core accretion is this race against time to build your core before the uh, disk runs out of gas. And so you expect a lot more you know, lower mass objects than higher mass ones. Uh, gravitational, gravitational instability actually goes in the other direction. It's so efficient that you actually overshoot planets entirely and make a lot more ground force. And, and so uh, you expect more higher mass uh, objects than lower mass ones with uh, gravitational instability. And finally, in terms of distance from the star, uh, at these wider separations beyond the snow line, you expect more close in companions with core accretion than further out. This has to do with pebble accretion and how pebbles migrate through the disk. Whereas gravitational instability, uh, expects planets to be at much larger orbital separations. And this has to be cool enough in order to uh, uh, for these uh, fragments to collapse. Uh, and so usually down about 50 AU is where you expect to find these uh, uh, gravitational instability objects. And if you ask these, uh, you know, the, you have these uh, three sets of predictions for core accretion, these three sets of predictions for gravitational instability, well, the core accretion uh, uh, predictions sound an awful lot like the GPI planets we saw. The demographics we saw of, of GPI's planets uh, nicely line up with uh, uh, the predictions of core accretion. Gravitational instability, not a great prediction of the planets seen with GPI's, but a plausible formation mechanism for the brown dwarf seen with GPI's. Uh, gravitational instability remains plausible for how these wide separation brown dwarfs came about. 
Okay, so those are the GPI's results. I want to go through some uh, other uh, recent uh, demographics results as well. Uh, um, recently, uh, some papers came out from uh, VLT Sphere, specifically the Shine survey, the first 150 stars of year with Shine, and demographics uh, uh, in this paper by uh, Arthur B. Don et al., uh, 2020. So um, uh, this is what the tongue plot from, from uh, Shine looks like uh, with the detections here uh, as the various dots. Uh, color-coded by uh, spectral type of the host star. Um, and uh, they looked at the demographics two different ways. Uh, one is this uh, idea of population synthesis, population synthesis uh, generating planets from core accretion from gravitational instability and seeing where they would lie on the tongue plot compared to actual uh, detections. And in this case, this was done mainly for solar type stars, FGK stars, uh, but you know, uh, there's this population of core accretion uh, planets uh, there's this population of gravitational uh, a uh, population of gravitational instability planets at these wider separations, population of core accretion planets at these smaller separations. Um, and what they find is that you know neither model by itself is a really good job of uh, predicting the observations. And rather a combination of core accretion and gravitational instability uh, is needed to, uh, to really explain the observations. Uh, and so this is sort of the difference between doing population synthesis and uh, the sort of uh, parameterized model uh, approach. Uh, either way, you know, it, it's a question of uh, you know, uh, where, where do you think these different uh, formation mechanisms predict each fine planets and comparing that to your actual detections. Um, okay, uh, the, uh, they uh, examine demographics one more way uh, with, with a, again, a slightly different parameterized model uh, with a combination of uh, uh, a brown dwarf model and the giant planet model, uh, brown dwarfs uh, in blue here, which is you know relatively consistent across uh, a spectral type of the host star, uh, but then the uh, the planet population in green here changes a lot as you change the mass of the host star. So you know a, a, a relatively you know large occurrence rate uh, at uh, uh, you know high mass stars, and then smaller occurrence rates for lower mass stars. Uh, so again, consistent with the G5 results again. Uh, more giant wide separation giant planets around high mass stars and low mass stars. Okay. And just you know, com uh, comparing tongue plots here, uh, you know, this, this sort of shows how uh, completeness varies with the property of the instrument. Uh, so both the GPI and Sphere uh, have an integral field spectrograph uh, uh, that's you know very good at seeing planets within about one AU of the host star. And so you know the, the, the tongue plots look uh, relatively similar. Uh, at the inner part, uh, inner part of the two tongue plots, uh, Sphere has a second channel uh, that'll uh, um, a slightly wider field, a more broadband uh, uh, imager, uh, which is more sensitive to uh, planets at wider separations, but down to lower masses. And so you see this extension of the, of the Sphere tongue plot compared to GPI again from the differences in instrumentation. Uh, the how you design your instrument sets up your completeness, sets up what your eventual tongue plot looks like, and your sensitivity to, to, to planets of brown dwarfs. And again, you see these th this population here of wider separation brown dwarfs seen with sphere, uh, but not seen with GPI, again, because of the sensitivity of the two surveys at these wider separations. Okay, well, I'm just going to mention a couple other demographic results. Uh, one is a correlation uh, between whether or not the host star has a debut disk and whether or not the host star has a uh, wide separation giant planets. Uh, this is uh, work by Tiffany Meshkett from a few years ago. Uh, and again, for especially for early type stars, um, the early type stars with a debris disk have a much higher planned occurrence rate than early type stars without a debris disk. Uh, and so again, a correlation between having a debris disk and having a giant planet. Um, uh, one more result uh, uh, from about a year ago. Uh, this is uh, looking at the eccentricity distributions of planets versus brown dwarfs. Uh, again, you know, dem demographics, you know, uh, any, any uh, parameter of the star or planet is fair game to figure out are there trends with uh, uh, in, in the current rate, in this case, in the eccentricity distribution uh, of planets versus brown dwarfs. And whether you think about you know, planets and, and brown dwarfs as being divided at a particular mass, or you think of planets and brown dwarfs as being divided at a particular mass ratio, uh, the result was pretty similar. That there's a more circular, uh, uh, more circular orbits for low mass uh, companions and more eccentric orbits for higher mass companions, and it points to the idea that there are two different formation mechanisms for planets and brown dwarfs. Again, echoing the GPI results. Okay, um, and I'm, I'm just going to you know leave you with these little teases here of uh, uh, demographics going into the future. Uh, for demographics of direct imaging, there's going to be a lot of you know new telescopes, new instrumentation going forward. 
I'm not even showing the uh, 30 meter telescopes on, uh, on, this, on, on this slide, but uh, the, uh, they all have a huge uh, uh, role to play in direct imaging going forward as well. Uh, GPI-2 is uh, you know, underway. Uh, construction has begun uh, to upgrade the Gemini Prime Imager uh, for you know, better contrast, better inner working angle. Uh, a, a, a lot of work will go, uh, uh, go into this before uh, GPI is moved uh, from Gemini South uh, to Gemini North. Uh, so you know, look forward to some of the some of the uh, you know, results as that comes further along. Uh, Skexao is uh, you know uh, constantly uh, uh, pioneering new ways of uh, uh, you know getting higher contrast, you know better better images of exoplanets. Um, so you know a lot of impressive uh, instrumentation work uh, uh, to really push push the limits there. Uh, a couple of you know interesting um, uh, if not survey instruments, follow up instruments, uh, KPIC and gravity. Um, you know, KPIC is, is uh, you know, showing the ability to uh, get really high resolution spectra of known exoplanets. And gravity at, at VLTI uh, has shown the ability to not just get high resolution spectra, uh, but also to make you know, very, very precise astrometric measurements of some of these direct image planets. Uh, and so, you know, th th these, uh, you know, uh, uh, not just current instrumentation, but future instrumentation will really change, uh, you know, uh, how we think about uh, uh, demographics at these wide separation giant planets. And of course, uh, space-based uh, uh, demographics work will be done as well. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to uh, tell us a lot more about. Uh, uh, it's going to tell us a lot more about uh, some of these giant planets. Uh, uh, some of these direct image planets can be observed by uh, James Webb as well. Uh, we'll learn more about the uh, uh, thermal infrared and really get a better uh, handle on the planet parameters, which again go back to the planet demographics. And finally. Reflected light Jupiter analogs will finally be possible thanks to the Roman Space Telescope and particularly the chronographic uh, uh, instruments. Okay. Um, in terms of astrometry, uh, uh, you know we're all very eagerly awaiting Gaia DR4, uh, probably a few years away, um, and in particular the uh, exoplanet catalog of giant planets around nearby stars. And you know we're going to about, we'll probably talk about not, not hundreds of planets but thousands of planets. And which will really, you know, enable some, you know, very high precision work on exoplanet demographics for these, you know, intermediate separation giant planets. And of course, microlensing. Um, the slide still says W first, uh, but the Roman Space Telescope will have a significant uh, microlensing component as well. Um, you know, sort of again, sort of the sweet spot of about you know, one-ish to ten-ish AU, a little bit further out, a little bit further in, uh, but really going out to you know quite low planet masses. Uh, and so you know, this should you know, really change how we think about exoplanet demographics going forward uh, once we have this you know, uh, uh, brand new set of planets in a part of parameter space that you know, is, hasn't really been fully uh, uh, constrained by other techniques. Okay, so just to conclude, um, you know, exoplanet demographics, uh, very important. Uh, uh, one of the you know, biggest impact it has is it gives us a way to test theories of planet formation and evolution. And um, the, the results from uh, the, the direct imaging surveys uh, looking at wide separation giant planets so far, uh, the way I would rephrase it as right now things are looking most consistent with core accretion over gravitational instability. But you know, there are still some, uh, some of these results that are at relatively low most st 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 statistical significance. And so more observations, more objects going forward uh, should help us you know, uh, really uh, figure out what's going on there. And finally, uh, you know, future instrumentation, future telescopes uh, will allow us to you know, make these measurements much more precisely. Uh, and in particular, one of the things that's you know really looking forward to uh, is uh, you know starting to get overlaps between the different met uh, methods. You're starting to see a little bit of this now, but there'll be even more going forward. Uh, planets that you see with direct imaging and also uh, detect with Gaia. Planets that you see with direct imaging also detect with radio velocity. Combine the precise mass measurements uh, with the uh, spectra and luminosity measurements. Okay. And I will uh, finish up just by showing this slide one more time. Uh, you know, check out SIG2 if you're interested in exoplanet demographics. Uh, if you're looking for a nice archive of uh, demographic papers, uh, check out the NASA Exoplanet Archive. Uh, otherwise, enjoy the rest of the, the summer school. Uh, and you know, uh, let me know if you have any questions. All right. Thank you.